message today, A Thief in the Night. As I was studying earlier this morning, some of this stuff's a little rough around the edges because when you realize where the church is at, the church for too long has thought they got it all together. They're under this little safety net. And everything's good. Because their name's in the book of life, and they're going to heaven. Well, no. Because this morning I opened up the Bible, I was reading, praying before I study again for Sunday. Turn me to Psalm 135. When you go back and read that sometime, it says, The Lord does as He pleases in heaven and earth. As He pleases. As He pleases, not you. Because mainly what we think is pleasing rubs Him the wrong way. I went, oh. So when God is going to deal with His church, they're not going to like the way He rubs them. And He's going to say, I'm God. I do exactly what I want. Because I have my purposes in mind and not yours. It says, when he talks about in the Proverbs how, how can man even understand his own ways because the ways of heaven are so far above ours is what he's saying. That's why we have to stop trying to figure out who he is except that he is the great I am. Then he can lead you by his spirit of truth. When you stop trying to figure out how great God is because we can't. We really can't. There's just no way we can comprehend that in our human suits, like Lynn would say. Okay? So there's no way that we can really get a hold of God's greatness. We can get revelation of it as we go. Like I said, the Word after 23 years is, is coming alive to me more than ever before. And it's so powerful that that happened. Because the more you study God's Word by His Spirit, the more that this will come alive to you. I got, a, I got a text from a guy the other day, and he goes, what do I do for my heart and mind to bring peace? I'm thinking, well, what do you mean you want scriptures? I said, what do I do? List Genesis to Revelation. So I prayed about it, and I sent him a text back this morning. I said, it says in Romans 12, renew your mind. I said, open up the book and ask the Holy Spirit what's going to bring peace to you. Because I don't know about you, when I'm struggling... I go to some of my favorite songs. That, that book just does something for me. You go to Psalm 1, you go to Psalm 91, Psalm 103, Psalm 27, Psalm 30. Some of the ones that really touch have touched me over the years, Psalm 21, a lot of those I can quote because I've meditated on them so much. But they bring a refreshing and a renewing because this is the living water, remember, not just the living word. And when I put it in, and it goes in here, it goes down into my heart and soul. So that's what I texted him this morning. Romans 12, 1 and 2, don't be conformed to the world. Don't even want to be like it. But renew your mind. We renew our mind with the Word of God. And I said, let the Spirit lead you. Because whatever your troubles are, in your heart, mind, and soul, no matter what need it is, your answers are here. And the Holy Spirit will lead you to something like it says in Psalm 19, to restore your soul. That's making you at peace inside. So it's all about the Word of God. And the problem with the Word of God is we sit on it. That's why He's going to come as a thief in the night to the church. That word thief is to cower. That means something that lurks. A person who steals secretly. One guilty of theft. To thieve, that's the action part of the word. That's to commit it, to keep doing it, the action of, to be a thief. Some people are addicted to it. They can't. Kleptomaniacs. I knew some people, no matter where we went, they took a salt shaker, they took a spoon, they took something. Yeah. We went to the store, it may just be a lollipop, but they had to take something. It's called the kleptomaniac. It's a, it's, it's a demonic spirit. They can't help themselves. They don't want to, but they can help but take something. Because back even when I was a heathen, I used to look at people going, you don't have any silverware at home? Well, I'll buy you a set. <laughs> and that's when I was a heathen. I'm going, what are you doing? Well, I'd just like to take something home as a memento. I said, no, you just stole something off the table. We come here to eat all the time. That's really not going to go good. They're not going to want us back. They didn't want us back for other reasons. We'll leave that alone. <laughs> but that's the end of there. Each year we used to have a softball banquet. We had to change what team name we had every year. <laughs> They caught on after the third year. Oh, buddy. <clears throat> so that being said, 
But do you see what I'm saying? But, if, but Jesus comes as a thief in the night. But it says one who's guilty. That word thief. Our God is guilty of nothing. Never has been. He never will be guilty of anything. Maybe guilty of loving us too much. When we didn't do anything to earn him or deserve him. But he's not guilty because there's no sin in him. He was a sinless sacrifice. That's why he broke the power of sin and of darkness. Because he was perfect. So for God to tell me he's a thief in the night. And he's going to come to the church as a thief in the night. I sat there and looked and said, wait a minute. First of all, you're no thief. Because you're the giver of life. You're the giver of eternal life. You're the giver of your blood to wash us of our sins. You gave us of your spirit to seal us. You are perfect in everything. You are holy. You are righteous. You are true. You are just. So how do you equate yourself to a thief? He said, first of all, everything's mine. I can take and give as I choose. I am the Lord thy God, and I do as I please for my purposes. Even we talked about the other night. Jesus is glorified in the Father and the Father and the Son by what they bring upon the earth. They work together, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's so important that we realize when Jesus says, I'm coming as a thief, he's justified to come take what he wants. He owns everything. He owns everything in the universe. It's his to give and distribute as he sees fit. He gives life. He takes life. It's his decision, not ours. But we can speed up the process if we're not careful. Like I said, there's many in the Church of America today, especially in this country, that have taken God for granted. They go to church because they think it's their responsibility to God, and that is the farthest thing from the truth. You are, to, you are the church, so when you come in here, you're, you're already at church. You were at church when you woke up this morning because you are the church. You didn't come to church. You came to fellowship in a building with your brothers and sisters that are part of the church. That's what we have to change the thinking in the body of Christ. See, we had church last night at Mom's Diner. We had church last night at Dairy Queen because the church was there and we fellowshiped in Christ. We have to change our whole mindset. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 24. The church needs a spiritual revival from the inside out. Matthew 24. Meditate on that chapter when you got time because it'll keep you from all the false teachers today. That one chapter. Because it answers most of what you hear today about all these guys with all their interpretations of the book of Revelation. And when Jesus is coming. And it's going to be 70 weeks times 70 weeks. It's going to be this many days after that many days. And this many days in those days. No, this chapter eliminates all their absolutes. The absolute is God knows when he's coming and nobody else. You can get your calendars out, you can get your computers out, and your calculators, but we don't know. And when people start giving you dates and times, now I've given prophetic words and it's happened exactly when God said it was going to happen. But you'll never hear me say, three weeks from Tuesday, get ready, Jesus is coming. Because <laughs> this whole chapter tells you don't ever do that and don't listen to anyone that does. But it does say a lot of other things in there that's so important. In verse... That beginning of that, chapters 36 to 51, go back and read that, verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Right there, that eliminates anybody telling you when God's coming back. It just eliminates it. Jesus said it. It's a fact. It is. It's an infallible truth, and it can't be changed. When people come to you and try and get you going, well, you know, if you go back to the book of Daniel... And you equate that with Revelation, this, that, and the other thing. And this is how many weeks we got. And seven years from now, this is going to happen. And then two days after that, this is going to happen. So you know what? You a man of God, you didn't read the book. Because it says you don't know. So why are you talking? Keep yourself from the false teachers. Keep yourself from them. Because they're going to come like you can't even believe in the days we're in. Because even the elect are going to be deceived. That's why I push all of you, study the Word. Let the Holy Spirit teach you what's in you. So when nonsense comes at you and false teachings, you go, God bless you, have a nice day, bye. And don't listen. Don't listen. Verses 42 to 44, watch. Therefore, for you do not know what hour the Lord is coming, but know this. If the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. 
Oh. You know what that is? If we were more about our Father's business, first of all, you wouldn't worry about what He's coming because then you're always ready. Because then you're going to know He numbered your days you did. The problem is too many people want to number their days. Mm -hmm. You're still here. I hope Jesus comes back soon. Why? You're not ready to meet Him. You haven't fulfilled your purposes. That's why He said, jump when we open. Who's really ready? No, we're not. We're not done yet. God's not done with us yet. He wants to use us more. There's too many people unsaved out here. There's too many people in the churches with broken hearts that have been reconciled to their brothers and sisters. There's too many people walking around in the body of Christ today that are broken hearted instead of having a healed heart so they can help really reach the lost. Because if you're out ministering with a broken heart, with judgments and hatred and anger in it, because you haven't let the love of Jesus heal you, forget the other half. That's not your job. Your job is for God to heal you so you can minister the power of His love to others. And if you're out witnessing to somebody about the love of Jesus, and every word out of your mouth is, I'm going to get even with that person and this person and that person, and you're clocking up your Glock and you're getting ready. No, no, and no. You're telling them somebody loves them from heaven and died from them. Meanwhile, you're going to go out and get even with everybody. No, we're not. Believe me something, it took me years to get past all that stuff. I didn't just all of a sudden wake up one day, oh, I got this all together, I love everybody. I wouldn't even close. It took years for God to purge anger and hatred and bitterness and the wrongs that were done to me. First of all, as a heathen the first 37 years, everything that happened to me, I deserved it. I'm the one that caused it. <laughs> and when God started showing me that mirror reflection thing, you were doing all this and you wanted something good to come out of it? Really? You were hanging around with liars, drug dealers, murderers, thieves, working girls, all those things you were doing, you were corrupt, you cheated, you lied, you stole. We, the list keeps going. And you wanted something good out of that. I was still, I still had my hit list ready. Who are you kidding? Um, but the thing is, then he says, you reaped what you sowed. See, everybody thinks that's money. Oh, it's what you reap of your heart into the kingdom of God is what you will receive back. If you reap if you sow love and mercy and forgiveness and peace and joy and kindness, you know what? You won't get it back from everybody. I can tell you that right now. You're just not. You're just not. So accept the fact that humans are humans. And guess what? When the stuff does come to hurt you, you're going to be ready because you're focused on your Father's will and not on people's will. That's your protection. That's your armor of God. If you're focused on doing the will of your Father, He'll surround you in ways, oh my God. When He's been teaching me all these years about the power of forgiveness, forgive people before they hurt you. And then guess what? It can't stick to you. It can't touch you. It can't hold you. It can't do anything. Because that stuff will hurt you. But when you get it out, like we saw today, confess to God what's hurt you. He already knows then He will bring the healing. Then you will be restored. He'll deal with the people that do all the hurting. We talked about two kinds of rain last week. There's a judgment rain and there's a blessing rain. Choose a blessing rain today. Yes. Because the sooner you let go of where you've been, the sooner God can heal and restore you and take you to where only God can take you. I can't. Your husband and wife can't. Your children can't. The world can't. God wants to take you to a place that only He can take you to. But if you're not concerned and going, God, what are you going to do with me every day? Then the world still has you. You're still concerned with what people think. It says to be ready and watchful. If you're watching what the Lord wants to do and listening to what the Lord is saying, this world won't touch you and they'll know it. They won't like, they'll like you even less. And that's okay. Like I said, if you know how much God loves you, they'll get over themselves. What did that one thing on Facebook say? Be yourself, the world will adjust. <laughs> Be yourselves. The world will get over themselves. Because if you're not yourself, you know what? You've lost your uniqueness that God put in you. We are individually made creative work of Almighty God. That's who we are. And if you're worried about what they think of you, then you're not going to be you. And then the world misses out on someone. Think about what God's saying today. If you're not you who you are, I mean, if David Walsh wasn't the way he was, I probably wouldn't like him. If he was trying to be some kind of religious man walking around straight up and down, and he wasn't the character he is, but he brings God's joy in here. 
because he's David Welsh. He's not somebody else. Mike Simpson is Mike Simpson. My wife is my wife. Karen is Karen. Claudia is Claudia. That's a whole other ball game there. Right? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but that's what I mean. We're family. Amen. And you can do that because everything in here better be done in love. Well, God's not going to want to be here. Amen. Think about that. Be yourselves, and the world will adjust to you. Forget about it. Don't try and adjust to the world. Amen? Amen. Sometimes Facebook does have good stuff on it. <clears throat> this was the one. Go back and read this sometime. Revelation 3.3. 3. He will come upon the dead church as a thief. Paul was asking we should do more for Revelation. Every now and then I put it in there. Like I said with her, I'm very careful with Revelation because there's so many teachings out there and none of it's of God. Very, very little do I hear somebody talking about Revelation where they haven't come up with numbers and dates and times to justify some kind of doctrine to tell me they know when God's coming. A lot of Revelation is symbolic because that's how they wrote in those days. So we got a picture of what God's doing. Revelation 1 4. Now, this is the part about being watchful. To him who is, and who was, and who is to come. He's coming back. Get about your father's business today. Remember who you're here for. Never desire acceptance from people, but from God, because you're accepted by what Jesus did on the cross. You are accepted in in the Father's kingdom because of His beloved Son. He now calls you His beloved children. Live with that in your heart and mind. And then you won't worry about what anybody says about you from that point on. It really won't even be able to stick to you because you're going to realize, hey, I'm accepted before the Father because of the beloved Son of God. I am now His beloved child, son or daughter. That eliminates everything. It really does. It takes the whole world out of the equation. Now you know you're accepted to the Father through the beloved Son of God as in a beloved child of God. That's what it says. If you love me, you love my Father. You get the whole package. It says, but if you only want part of God, you can't have Him. Because if you don't have the Son, or you reject one part of the triune God, you reject all of God. You can't just have part of Him, it says in the book of John. I think it's in 1 John. You've got to have everything of God. He wants to give you all that He is. But if you're not willing to say, not my will, but your will be done, you will not. If you're not about your father's business, preparing for the great and coming day of the Lord, we are in the Elijah generation. We are making a way for his return. Do we know when it is? No. Don't be concerned because we're going to heaven anyway. But don't take your eternal destiny for granted that it's all over. Your work's finished. Your work has just begun. All of our work here has just begun. You're going through changes, you're going through a healing, you're going through a purging and a sifting, so the fullness of God can emanate out of you. So people you're going to see in the scriptures, they're going to call upon you. They're going to seek you out when you're about your father's business. In 1 Peter 4.17, it is time for the judgment to begin in the house of God, it says. That's what I said, he's coming for the dead church. And people that don't get up and tell you the truth about what God's coming for first, don't listen to them. Do not listen. He's coming for the church, folks, without spot or wrinkle. Every one of you has a divine, holy, righteous, godly purpose. Don't look at the TV and pastors. Don't look at a van. We, we have a missionary coming all the way from Israel here. I can't even imagine how blessed I am that God would even do that for us. Maybe it's all love for Israel. I'm sure that's part of it. But for her to come here and take time out of her time to come over to Pahrump, she had to ask, where is Pahrump? <laughs> she sent me an email the other day. Could you give me some directions? There's people coming from Vegas when I'm out there. Because she's going to be in Havasu, then she's going to come up to Vegas, come out to Pahrump, and then she's going up to Mesquite for a, a weekend thing. Uh, speaking engagements up there. See what I'm saying, though? Where's Pahrump? <laughs> what? <laughs> I remember when we moved out here, my dad goes, I can't find that. Where is that? I said, Dad, he was spelling it what, one letter off. And I, so I spelled it. I said, now type this into the computer. He goes, oh, 
really don't even look like it's there on the computer. <laughs> you know why we're in Peron? For a time such as this, God's going to do a great work here. And it's going to be talked about. Because God's going to reconcile people. God's going to arise. The blind are going to see. The lame are going to walk. The deaf are going to hear. The dead are going to be raised. Because God has said so. I don't tell you anything up here that doesn't line up with this. I will not. And the day I do, find another pastor. Because now I've told you something I think instead of something the Holy Spirit has told me. It's not my job to tell you anything that I think. I know what I feel inside. I know what I see the world doing. But I know God says, if you follow me, Dennis, and you work, and your whole heart is set on doing my will and not yours, I will bless you with grace and peace. I will provide all of your need for your journey home. I will take care of everything you're going to need spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, if you do my will, if you seek my kingdom first. That means I'm on watch for the great and coming day of the Lord. But I'm not worried about when it gets here. I just want to fulfill my God-given destiny. Is that really your heart today? Because if it is, you're not going to look out there. You're going to look up there. He can't guide you when you're in love with the world or you're listening to what the world says. Okay, it's coming apart in the Middle East. We knew this was coming. It said that's going to happen. They're all going to turn on Israel. They're going to be surrounded on every side. The governments are going to fall away from God. That's happened all over the earth. He said it's going to, and it's here. And the days are now. But guess what? You walk with Jesus, you're going to make a difference out there. Amen. You walk in and of your own wisdom and discernment and understanding and think you got it all together without Jesus Christ, you're toast when you leave here today. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to James 4. There's such an urgency in my spirit that we reach the lost. And that we pray for reconciliation in God's church. There's such an urgency inside. As I was changing this whole message around for four straight hours yesterday, God was changing. Forgive me, Lord. I didn't change anything. Verses 13 and 14. Come now you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there. Buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. I felt an urgency this whole past week like never before. And then what did he do? He put people in our past from this valley into our path to bring reconciliation. So we can start coming back together as a family of one. See what's happening? There's an urgency inside of me. Because life is a vapor. Everybody says, I'll find God next year. When I'm done partying, I'll get to Him. No, they won't. Because it says right there, your life is gone like that. Because God's cycle of mercy you know, on a person's life goes in circles. Sooner or later, the circles stop coming around. He gives you chance, chance, chance to come to Him. Chance, chance, chance to come to Him. Sooner or later, that stops. At the midnight hour. And they're gone like a vapor. I saw the seriousness of where people are at this week like never before on this planet. I saw how quickly life is going to end for a lot of people and they don't know Jesus because the church is too busy. You all got saved. I got saved. God had that appointed time. There's an appointed time for everybody to come to know Jesus Christ. It's our job to tell them life is but a vapor. I only use that verse sometimes but it hit me so strong this week. He said take this whole section out. Put that here. Let people know the urgency is now. His patience is at an all-time low. His mercy will never run out. <clears throat> Excuse me. His love will never run out. But if you've got loved ones that don't know the Lord in your family, intercede for them unless God tells you not to. They've gone past the point of no return. Because that does happen. Some people harden their hearts so, so, so strong like this floor that not even God's love can penetrate. That's a scary thought all in itself, that someone is that hurt and that wounded that even the love of Jesus can't soften them. But some people choose that. They really do. Keep moving. Jesus kept going, kept going, kept going, kept going until they nailed him to the cross. Then he said, it is finished. Your job is not finished yet. He has people he wants to reach through you. He did it to my wife and I this past week. We left at a certain time, somebody there. She had a client cancel. It turned into a whole series of ministry 
things right after that for the next couple of hours. See, God's got it all lined up for you if you hear what the Spirit would say to you. Put your life aside. You are not your own. It is time for us to give up on ourselves and trust in the will of the Father who divinely wrote out your life before He made this universe. You're not going to have a rich, rewarding life until you say, Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Not my will, but your will be done. And then thank Him that He'll give you the grace to do it. Because if you go out that door and you think, Father, I'm going to serve you, because I know you sent Jesus, and I got the Holy Ghost. You started off wrong, I. You need His grace. You need His Spirit. But what you need are ears to hear what the Spirit would tell you today. The Spirit would tell you life is but a vapor. We need to go back to being thankful because my life, I don't know about you, was on my deathbed when God came and got me. I was dying. They were waiting for me. I knew I was going to die any time. My body was dying. I knew it. My life was but a vapor. And God showed mercy and said, okay, now that you're there, now you'll listen. He never judged me. All God did was love. He never judged me. He never said, okay, surrender your heart so I can judge you. No, he said, surrender your heart to your Savior. You're mine now. I own you. Now let me love you. He never judged me for one thing. They now to know out here. The lost have to know they can lead a life without judgment and condemnation. They have to know it. But they're only going to know it if we tell them. Life is but a vapor, ladies and gentlemen, and God wants you to know that. So when you see a lost soul next time, and he says, go talk to that person, you put down what you're doing, and you talk to that person, because their vapor may be coming for them. We need to take this serious. This has done something to me this week. I've been burning up all week, only because I said, God, if I got an agenda left, remove it. I've had a headache since 4 o'clock this morning. <laughs> So whatever my stinking thinking had, he's burning it out. I gave him permission. If there's something in me that's hindering me from fulfilling my purposes, burn it out, pull it out, knock it out, do what you got to do. So I can fulfill my destiny. So I don't miss one soul that you want me to talk to. Because if I do, I've taken my salvation for granted. God's not here to judge us today. He's here to convict us today of who we belong to and why you're here. You're here for His glory and for no other purpose are you here. Oh, thank you, Jesus, how much you love us. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. We look at the things that are temporary all the time. Not the things that are eternal. It really talks about that. It talks about it in Corinthians quite a bit. Don't look at the things that are temporal for their perishing. Look at the things that are eternal. It's in a bunch of different chapters there. This is a temporal existence for where we're going. That's all this is. This is a stopover. People go, how do you call this a stopover? I said, because I'm going to live forever. No, you're going to die. No, no, no. You got, I'm going to live forever. See the book? It says, I'm going to live forever. Because if I believe in Jesus, it says, though, yes, the flesh will die. I'm going to, I'm going to live forever. You're going to live forever. You're going to live forever. Think about that. You're going to live forever. So what you see with your natural eyes, this is a temporary stopover. This is a filling station. You know what it's filling with? That's as you serve God and you're pleasing to Him. That's going to get your out of boys when you get home. And you're going to get up into the kingdom. He's going to have all these little crowns to put on you when you get there because you serve God. You may just give somebody a glass of water today, but all of heaven's going to blow the trumpet and rejoice because you did the will of your Father. What you've done to the least of these little ones, you've done unto Jesus. It is so important that you get a hold of this today. And what God's doing in you. And why you're here. I don't care what the world tells you anymore. Stop listening. Listen to what God says. You are here to be a witness of the saving grace of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you were born. Amen. The rest of the stuff is extra. Yeah, we got jobs, we got stuff we have to do. That's all fine. But you were here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, that's for preachers. No, you can't get away with that in here because I'll get the old video out and we'll show the one about how you were all ordained before the face of the earth. You're not going to get away with stuff in here. Because what it says in here, you're going to be held accountable to because I told you, so then I'm good. See, if I tell you what God tells you to do, God told me your hands are clean. Thank you, Jesus. I'm innocent. Amen. With all my love.
to share in the love. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 19. Oh, God, so good. Now this is Zacchaeus, and what happened is he's a little guy, he ran up in the tree because he heard Jesus was coming. Now, yeah, Zach, it's C-A-K-E is how they actually pronounce that. I'm like, wow, it's got all these letters in it. It's only pronounced like that. Really. Praise God. I looked up the Bible dictionary and went, why'd you put all the letters there then? Zacchaeus. <laughs> um, yeah, Zach actually. Z-A-K is how it's pronounced in the Hebrew. Um, so, uh, believe me, something I was struggling with the word yesterday. I looked up in the Bible dictionary. It's only good about having those things. It tells you all that. <laughs> My wife had a customer the other day. They were in there talking about things and foreign languages and all this stuff. And I guess down in Apple Valley, it's all taken over by people that don't even speak English anymore. And she told the one person, "No, I speak. I speak two languages." And they said, "What do you speak?" I speak English and I speak tongues. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's my two languages, amen. That's um, cute. <laughs> now, what happened though, he was one of the worst ones. That's why it starts off like this. See, tax collectors then, they were born Jews, but they collected taxes for the Romans. And he was probably one of the bigger ones because they didn't like him even a little bit. That means he was taking a lot more out of the kitty than he was supposed to. Mm -hmm. They were really taxing the Jewish people to support the Roman Empire. That's why tax collectors, they were Jewish people going to Jewish people to collect unfair taxes to give to the Romans. They were not well-liked people. Yeah. Like I said, when Jesus comes for people, he doesn't come for the ones that got it all together. Mm -hmm. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Verses 7 to 9. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. If I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Watch this, Today salvation has come to this house. Today. What came to his house? Salvation. When you go to people's houses, you bring salvation to people's homes. When you go to the lost, you bring salvation because salvation is alive and well in you. Salvation is alive in you. Salvation is Jesus Christ. Because without him, there is none. There's no salvation without Jesus. None. Because this is what really got the Jews. <laughs> because he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has what? Come to seek and to save that which is lost. We've lost our way in the church. You hear a lot of teachings out there? They're going to teach how to have things, how to be somebody, how to be all that. But they don't teach you you're here to take salvation to people, to seek and to save those that are lost. That's your job while you're on this planet. All the other stuff you do, you're living, whatever it is, that's fine. But you're to seek and to save those that are lost. You're to bring salvation. Salvation walked into his home. When you walk into someone's home, when you walk up to a lost soul, salvation has walked up to them. Because the living salvation, Jesus Christ, is already alive. I got a picture of that this week. It almost knocked me right out of the chair. He says, when you go into a home, you bring my salvation. Because you bring my Amen. life and save humanity. Hallelujah. That's the power that's in you. The power of salvation should be alive and well in us today. That's what we have in us. And we leave here, we go get something to eat, we go home, and that's it for the week. And we got a town that's perishing. But the one thing I got this week talking to people that I haven't talked to in years was they can all feel the Spirit of God moving. God's doing something in Pahrump. We talked about some of the prophetic words that have been spoken over this valley last night. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it's coming. Because God's bringing the words that were spoken at that tent revival, that not just myself, but other men and women of God spoke that week. 
They're all talking about those prophetic words that were spoken because now God is poking people's spirit to come back alive. The dead church needs to wake up to seek and to save those that are lost. You need to start bringing salvation to people because that's what you're called to. Feeding people is good. Helping people out financially is good. Fixing things, helping them out, fine. But we need to go back to a mentality in our heart and mind. I've come to seek and to save those that are lost. If you would allow God to live in you, you would see the lost as just what they are. Lost souls that need salvation. Now start taking salvation to people and stop with all your fancy words because that's not going to help anybody. The love of the salvation of Jesus Christ on that cross is what's going to give them hope and nothing else. But you've got to let God into you to heal you first. So the power of His salvation can come off your tongue. Because what comes off your tongue is what comes from your heart. Oh, hallelujah. God is oh, so good. Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We thank need to change. Lord. Remember something? When Jesus said He was the son of Abraham, can you imagine how mad they were? Because they just thought they was, they was all that. What Jews? Everybody else, they considered you dogs. What that meant is you were a long form of life. You weren't taught by the Jews, nor educated, nor did you have their bloodline. Here it is, one of the worst tax collectors of his day. And then he said, see, but he had a changed heart. I'm sorry. He met Jesus, and his heart changed. I'm giving back. Mm -hmm. And he gave back more than the thief even had to. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm going to give back fourfold all that I've taken unjustly. He met Jesus, his heart was changed. Hallelujah. That's how you know a real Christian today. By how they speak to one another and how they speak to the lost. It's so important that we have a heart change why we're here. Because he's coming. Look at those words. To the church first. You know how many people are perishing on this planet without Jesus Christ right now? By the day, there's thousands and thousands of people dying all over this planet, here in America, that don't know Jesus Christ. There's too many people worried about doing and doing and doing and not saying, Father, not my will. Because when you, let me tell you something, you say, Father, not my will, your will be done, here I am today, He's going to hold you to it. Amen. I was reminded again this week, you gave me permission back here, He showed me when I was a baby Christian, you said I could do this to you to make you into a better vessel. I mean, He showed me a picture of where I was, what I was, and everything else at the time, I'm going... You don't remember my sins or anything? No, but I remember when you gave me permission to change you. I gave you the grace to say those words, so I set you up there, too. Because you never would have said that in and of yourself. After the last 23 years, I'm a lot, a lot more cautious when God says, Listen, I need to do something. I'm going, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not so quick with my tongue anymore. <laughs> because he's going to require of all of us to let go of this. To let go of this. To let go of this. To let go of what's out in the spark of mine. He's going to require you to let go and give it back to its rightful owner. So that Amen. the will of the Father can rise up in you. Amen. You are planted in the house of the Lord as trees of righteousness. You will not bear fruit for your glorious king if you hang on to you. You can't. Because then him can't come out. You've got him in there. You have salvation in there. But it's not going to come out and touch lives Ooh, when you're all about you. Thank you, Jesus. This is serious. Oh, I've never felt, like I said, this week it changed me. Because I felt the seriousness of how I was seeing the world. I watched that movie arm again. I saw the end coming. I saw the fire coming. And I'm going, whoa, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. You said I got time. <laughs> wait a minute. Whoa. Whoa, Lord. You said I got time. My work's not finished. That says it's over. No, no, no. I'm just letting you know what's coming. Now you tell my children how urgent it is that they start taking salvation back oh, to the people. Yeah. To oh, seek and to save those that were lost. He came and got all of you and He came and got me. And we need to praise Him for that every day. And we need to have thankful hearts every day. Amen. Put your lives aside. You want your life to be rewarding and full and rich and filled with the joy of the Lord inside of you. Put yourself aside and say, Father, take over. I've been driving this car long enough. It's your turn. You take over, you're in charge, you're sovereign, you're Lord, you're God, and you can, because I can. Right Once now. you admit you can't, then he can. Because like I said, you ask any pastor that's known the Lord long enough, they fought with God every inch of the way like I have. Yeah. 
And they say, well, I can't do this, I can't do that. When you get to the fact, next time he asks you to do something, don't even say, I can't. He already knows that. He already knows you can. He asked you so he can in you and through you. That's why he asked you. So he's going to change your reactions to go, you know what? Something else I can't do, but praise God, I know you can. Let's go. That's Amen. how submissive he wants to his sovereign lordship. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. You've got to change it. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 9. This is not only lost souls, this Bible verse. 12 to 13. This is those in the house of God. There's so many walking wounded Christians that have quit fellowshipping with their brothers and sisters in Christ because the body of Christ, yes, has hurt them. But we need to forgive. Verses 12 to 13. When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. That was not only a rebuke to the Jewish leaders of his day, because they thought they had it all dialed in, and they were some kind of holy, perfect people. And no, they weren't. I met some people in my early days of Christianity that were involved in the holiness movement. Women couldn't wear earrings. Men sat there. Women sat here. I'm going, what's your wife doing on the other side of the church? Whoa, what's up with that? I thought the two become one. I'm, I left that alone. But then I got to know a few of them. And I went, oh, that Sunday stuff? What happened? Because then you saw them in the worldly element. The holiness movement kind of went away. I said, oh, you were in a holiness movement on Sunday. But by Monday afternoon, what you're doing, that, that's okay. See, we're watched as his children. You need to practice what you preach. And I'm living proof of that. <laughs> because I, when you get up here, you get a bullseye. <laughs> Everywhere you go, it's like... <laughs> they're watching you, but they're going to watch all of you. Because his light's go, so going to shine through you, they're going to know you belong to another. Mm -hmm. They're going to know. They, everybody that meets you should know you belong to another. Amen. That's how transformed you should be. That's God's real motive to make us into that. We become a new creature, but the creature needs seasoning and molding. Yes, sir. I became a new creation when I got saved. Then why are you still so messed up? Where's all that attitude coming from, really? Whoa. Your speech doesn't tell me you're a new creation yet. See, when he said this to them, they will live it because they consider themselves righteous. No. I'm the righteousness of God in who? Christ. Thank you. Christ Jesus. He made me righteous. He made me holy. He made me into a man of God. I did none of that. I said, yes, Lord, I can't, but you can. See, it goes back to surrender and everything. Your whole vessel into the hands of God. This whole verse that I desire mercy, not sacrifice, I said it before, Matthew 7, 1 through 6. Judge not, least you be judged. With the measure you use, it's going to be measured to you. If you go out and give the message of salvation, <clears throat> and you start telling this person, you sinner, you heathen, you this, you that, you've judged them, they're already getting judged. If you go to a lost soul with any kind of judgment, you've lost them. And you know what? You're going to have to stand before that. You're going to have to come to him and say, you gave me the right to go judge somebody. Oh, no. Well, that got quiet, didn't it? You know why it got quiet? Because we can't judge them. We're not allowed. I've checked this book for 23 years. It's not in here. It says if I judge another, it's going to come for me. Now, if you see a person stuck in sin, the Bible says to come alongside them and help them from darkness to light. But don't throw them to the sharks. Because if you're, you're witnessing salvation, what is salvation? Unmerited favor, the grace of God that gave you the faith to believe in the cross. So if you go out to the lost soul that's stuck in darkness and doing all this stuff wrong, if you go in judgment, they may not correct you, but he will. That's how serious a day we're in. We can't judge them because how they're going to know the love of Jesus. That means you became God. 
I mean, Michelle hovers when she comes in, but that's her. Nathan's got the right phone, so, but, you know, the rest yes. of us. Um, but it's, see what I'm saying, though? We should laugh because he is holy and perfect. And if we don't look at them the way he saw us, to seek and to save those that are lost, they're going to know you're judging them. Street people are no dummies. When people used to try and come to lead me to Jesus, when I was doing what I was doing, they gave me their holier-than-now stuff, thumping me with Bible verses, telling me I was going to go to hell. You know what my best punchline was? I already know that, so why are you wasting your breath? <laughs> and that's what I said. That shut them right up. What do you mean? I said, I'm already going. I already know where I'm going. Why do you think I'm doing what I'm doing? I'm a condemned vessel. I'm not getting that. I said a few other things. That's not appropriate from the pulpit. <laughs> but that's what I told them, and it stopped them from talking. You know why? Because they weren't sharing the love of Jesus. They were judging me and condemning me when I already was condemned. I was condemned by Catholicism, and I was condemned by the people around me. I was condemned by my own family. But guess what? God never condemned me. He saved me. So if you don't bring the message of salvation, the love of God, if you go out and bring condemnation and judgment on those people, let me tell you something, they already got it. It's already heavy on them. They already know their life is pretty much over. And I was convinced mine was too. And I bet some of you were also. But when the love of Jesus came and got me, and he wrapped his arms around me, and he poured his blood over me, not only that, he took his Holy Spirit, the living water's holiness in its purest form, and poured it into me. Guess what? That's what you all got. So don't you dare walk up to a lost soul that's living in darkness and speak any judgment to them because they already feel judged. The devil's got them convinced like I was and you were that there was no hope for me. They're in the same boat. That's why when I see them, my heart breaks. When I see the terror on the news and I see families being destroyed, I see children dying senselessly all over the world, it's like, oh my God, where do we go here? Where's humanity gone? They've gone from me. Now take <coughs> salvation back out to me. And then I will heal. <coughs> then I will save. Then I will restore. Church, we need to reset our perimeters. The world, you stay out here. Father, take me and use me. Amen. It can't come with any force of judgment. Because I'll tell you something, you're going to destroy. What did he say? Forgive them, they know not what they do. They don't. They're stuck, and so were all of you before salvation. Oh, hallelujah. God is so good. We're just about there. He turned me to something this week that really... In Isaiah 62, if you have your Bibles... This is the promise, the assurance that God gave to his children Israel of the salvation of Zion. But it's right along with the church today, too. You see some verses in here that's so powerful and how it represents us, because what he was calling them, he's called us. You'll see that in a second. Verses 10 to 12. Go through, go through the gates and prepare the way for the people. What are we to do? We're to go out as John the Baptist, Elijah, among us. Go out and prepare the great coming day of the Lord. Build up the highway. Take out the stones. Lift up the banner for the peoples. What banner do you lift up? Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner. We sang today the name of Jesus. You need to start lifting up the name of Jesus in the Lord. Because that is salvation. Because there is no other name by which men can be saved. When I read that... He said, what, what does banner mean? I said, Jehovah Nisi, okay. But that means Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my banner. He was saying, lift up my name. Salvation is coming. Oh, hallelujah. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, say to the daughter of Zion, surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him. And they shall call them holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall, oh wow, 
You shall be called sought out. They're going to seek us out. Oh, hallelujah. A city not forgotten. Believe me, God hasn't forgotten Perum. He hasn't forgotten America. He never forgot Zion. He never can and never will forget what He created. Because He came to save it all. Not some of it. Oh, hallelujah. That your holy people, 1 Peter 2, 4 to 10, were being built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. We're now called Christians. He was saying, I'm going to give you a new name. A new name. Our new name is Christian, child of the Most High God. The redeemed, the sanctified, the set free, the born again. That's who we are. Salvation has come. It says, get on the highways and prepare. It says, prepare for the great coming day of the Lord. We need to get a hold of what the Word says. That promise to Zion came in Calvary over 2,000 years ago. But even when He comes for the church, He's still redeeming His children Israel. You see that right now? They're all surrounded. Ain't nobody going to take the city of Jerusalem that belongs to God. That's His city. We belong to God. When I read that word, we won't be a forsaken city, I saw this city. God loves Purim. It's on the window. Jesus loves Purim. It's there. He means it. He said it. He means it. He'll do it. Amen. Yes. Start praising God that you live in the city of Purim. And then maybe He'll, out you. He'll enable you to go out and take salvation to some people. Because the more people get saved, the more the city's going to turn into a city of righteousness, yeah. which God created it for. He created this planet to be righteous and holy and a garden of Eden where His presence fills it up so people walk around healed and whole and restored to oneness with their King. But if we're not telling them that, then they can't come without salvation. We got all worked up and I got quiet. It can't come without this. Reconciliation doesn't come without this. Salvation doesn't come without that. Healing doesn't come without the cross. Nothing comes without the cross. Nothing. Nothing's going to happen unless you share the cross of salvation with people. We have to be changed, people. Zacchaeus, I mean, here's a guy that was despised by the Jews. Took all that money from him unrighteously. Never mind what he gave to the Romans. He was lying in his pockets. And yet Jesus said, you're the son of Abraham. By your faith in Jesus Christ, you're a child of Abraham. And all of his blessings are yours because of the cross. Remember, it goes this way. Started here, comes here, comes to Peru. Amen. Yeah. Comes to Peru. Thank you, Jesus. Salvation is of the Jews. It started there and came through Calvary. It's now here. We need to take it back out here. Thank you, Lord. We really need to make an effort to tell people. When he showed me salvation is alive in you, Dennis. It's in there. How can we keep salvation to ourselves? You know what working out your salvation means? You know what that actually means? Doing the will of the Father. Don't go, don't go, go home today. I've got to make a list of things i got to do. Because as soon as you do that, your carnal mind is going to take over. You're going to put pressure on you. God will never put on you. God says, be led by the Spirit. Oh, led by the Spirit. Then He'll put you in the path like us yesterday of one person after another that God wanted to touch and do a great work in. Because I've been praying for reconciliation. Well, it's beginning. There's cracks in the walls now. Now the walls aren't so tall. Before they were up here. Now they're down here. Now they're down here. We need to tear the walls down Amen. and have a holy city again. And it's not going to happen unless we get changed. Amen. We have to change. But you can't change yourself. Oh, hallelujah. you got to share that red phone with everybody, Nathan. So, so, <laughs> right. so you're holding yourself, brother, what's up? <laughs> God is so good. Oh, you should be at the men's group on Tuesday. We got it. Yeah, we got it going on. In John, the 12th chapter. As I just shared in 1 Peter, you're being built up as a spiritual house. A spiritual house needs something for people to see. Verses 31 to 33. <laughs> Remember something, in that house, there can only be one type of light. In John 8, it talks about he's the light of the world. 
There is no darkness in him, it talks about. Let the light of the gospel of truth of salvation make you glow. Because let me tell you something, nobody can put out his light. Yeah. And if you let his light shine, no one can touch that. They'll be afraid to touch it. Amen. In John 12, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world is cast out. Quit worrying about the devil. Because when he went to Calvary, he already disarmed him. He took his power away. Look at that. Jesus said he's going to be cast out right now. I got this. Now, do we cast out darkness? Do we rebuke darkness? You bet we do. But guess what? He's already been cast out. Lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. And if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Amen. Doesn't say in America. Doesn't say in Israel. It says all peoples. All shapes, sizes, nationalities, colors, languages, doesn't matter. All people that call upon the name of the Jesus Christ, He will lift them up from darkness to walk in His glorious light. Stop separating peoples, because all are the same to God. All are created in His image. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. This He said, signifying by what death He would die. The more you lift up the name of Jesus, the more people are going to seek you out. They're going to go, why do you talk about Jesus so much? You got him. You got him. Because the more you lift up his name, they're going to see the light of Jesus in you. Because the more you lift his name up, the more of what has the world on you will be gone. And the only thing they're going to see in your spiritual house, that's you, is his light. It's his light. He came with the seed. But if you talk about the world when you leave here, and you talk about things in life and trials and tribulations, guess what? That's <coughs> what they're going to hear. And they're going to say, wow, I thought you Christians were different. You should be so peculiar to the people that aren't saved that they walk away scratching their heads. You really should. Your whole language the way you see people, the way you talk to people, should be different. Should be different. Your light should so shine before men that they see your good works. And they glorify your Father in heaven, not you. The works of the Holy Spirit that are going to come through you. Stop trying to earn. Stop trying to do. Stop trying to make something happen. And let the God of all creation make it happen through you. But if you have a heart today to seek and to save those that are lost and to share salvation with people, He will draw them to you. And don't sit there and go, oh my God, what do I do now? Because that's what happens. I won't know what to say. Ask Moses what he told, when he told God, I, got to, I stutter. Oh, Aaron, yo, come here. All right, you tell him, he'll tell down. See, so don't make an excuse today. He doesn't accept excuses. He knows all your weaknesses. He knows your fears. He knows your shortcomings. He knows all of them. Heck, He let you have them so you would lean on Him and not you. Amen. We talked about it Wednesday night. Lean not on your own understanding. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. And let God have you today. Because if we don't change and we don't realize why we're really here on this earth, these people are all going to die without Jesus. This country is going to perish. America will be no more if the church doesn't change. We'll still be a country, but we'll be a shell of what we used to be. One nation under God. They're trying to remove God from our country. Are you going to stand up and say, no, you're not? Are you going to call on heaven who hears every one of your prayers and who will answer? If the church doesn't cry out for this country to remain one nation under God, it will not. The church went to sleep in 61, 62. They took God out of the classroom. Because the church did our own. That will never happen in America. You just condemned all our children because you sat in a church building on Sunday morning. And you let them take God away from your children. You told your children they don't need God anymore. Well, our children do need God. This country needs God. Humanity needs God. And we need to pray it. And we need to believe God's going to arise and put His name in headlights. Forget all these neon signs we see in the world. We just need to lift up the name of Jesus because that changes everything. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 6.
verses 1 to 3. This goes right along with James, life is but a vapor. Because a lot of people think they got plenty of time. I bet people look me in the face and go, I'll get to Jesus when I got time. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. If you insist. <laughs> We then as workers, together with Him also. You notice you don't do this alone. With who? With Jesus. You're not alone in this. He doesn't say, okay, go out and help save the world. No, 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 no. Workers with Him. Remember, you're bringing salvation. You're bringing the power of the finished work of the cross that saved you to people. You're a co-laborer of the work of the Holy Spirit. Stop putting pressure on yourself. With Him also, I plead you not to receive what? The grace of God in vain. Mm. For He says, in the acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. That's what I mean about false teaching. That's why people ask me why I'm so strict about what gets taught here. Because if false teaching is taught here, I'm going to be blamed, not you. I'm sorry I love you all, but I fear God, none of you. <laughs> I know what I'm responsible for up here. Today, see what it said though? Today's the day of salvation. There's some people out here right now that aren't going to make it through the day. They're not going to make it. Because I also got a strong word last night, and another brother here got it too yesterday. Death. There's a lot of people that have pushed the envelope, and they've pushed the envelope, and they've pushed the envelope. And I got that word so... I was in such a good place last night, and then the word death came to me, and I saw it. <coughs> we need to change. We need to be changed by God's Spirit. You have salvation living in you, even if you just witnessed the one person the rest of your life, that person got saved, that's why you were here. But that's that important to God. So no matter what you go through in life, you need to share salvation. Your eternal destiny is already a done deal. You need to share that with people. It's that close. There's people that are about to die that don't know Jesus every second of every day. And it's because the church is too busy doing their thing and not the Father's will. And it's not easy. Because God's going to require that you put your life down. He's going to require that you die to self. But He will give you the grace to do it. See, the greatest thing about God is you do the work with Him. And if you commit yourself to His will and not yours, the grace, like I talked about in Acts, if they had a founding grace, because their mission was to take the saving grace of the cross to the world. He said, go into all the world and preach in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost that there's salvation under no other name. And it is so important that we change everything that we see through God's eyes and not ours anymore. It is so important that you allow the love of Jesus to come in to heal and restore you so you can go take salvation to people. And remember something, ladies and gentlemen, if you talk to a lost soul this week and you judge them, you've just done it in vain. You've come against what he said it is finished. Three words. If he doesn't say those three words, nobody has the right to go to heaven. It's the finished work of the cross that saves people, not us. We take, them, we take salvation to them because salvation is in us. Change your perspective on how you witness to people. It's the power of salvation that's going to come out of you. What is the power of salvation? Immeasurable love when the Father sent the Son to Calvary. That's pure love. Unconditional love. People need to know that God loves them. He's not here to judge them. Remember those verses today? The seek and the save. The ones that are sick. The problem is there's too many sick. I want you to really start putting on your prayer list to pray for healing and reconciliation in the body of Christ. Because when I saw it just this week, there was a little light coming in. There was a little light coming in. It, am I cautious? Of course. I'm always going to be. That's one part of my street life that never went away. I'm still cautious of humans. 
You know why? Because I know myself. I know my shortcomings. Don't say it. <laughs> but the thing is, it's so important that you start seeing the loss through his eyes. Look at this cross, ladies and gentlemen. That's what came for you. That should change everything that you see now. If you see everybody outside these doors through his eyes. Through what happened over 2,000 years ago. It should change us from the inside out. It should be a revival in your heart to have a hunger and a thirst that they can have what you already have. You have a free gift living inside of you. It's time you started opening up that gift and allow it to go touch lives. Because it was a free gift given to you. It isn't something we earn. And it is time for us as his children to renew our passion for Christ. His passion for us was sealed right there. There's no, we can't even go how much he passionately loves us. We can't. But you need to have the passion he had for you when you leave here today. Not for what tomorrow morning is going to bring you, but for who out there needs you today. Don't think about tonight. Don't think about five minutes from now. Say, Lord, the rest of the, my life belongs to you, not this afternoon. I told you, when you think you've got a schedule, you're in trouble. Stop, stop, stop. Come on. Jennifer's got all together. Look what she's saying. See, laugh itself. Laugh itself, ladies and gentlemen. And then the will of the Father can come visit you. Amen. Amen. When you laugh at yourself, you know you can't. He can. He has you there. Because now your expectations are no longer on you, but on the one who died and rose again. When expectations are off your back and they're on where they belong on Him, then He will rise up in you and take you by the hand and you'll take salvation to people. But until you give up on yourself, you're going to try and figure out how to do it. I checked. Every time I try and figure, I just got to sit back down and go, there I go again. I try to think something through. Oh, my God. That is the worst thing in the world we can do. God will give you all the wisdom and knowledge you need to get through this world. He'll educate you. He'll teach you for your profession. Whatever you need, he said he's going to equip you. But what he most wants to equip us with is love to share salvation with people. Because that should take preeminence in every child of God's heart. If this changed me this much this week, I know it's going to change you. So put your lives aside and realize who you were born for. Bless you. Bless you. That's all right. I cried through the whole thing this week. Don't feel bad. Wednesday nights, everybody kind of strolls in, but on August 6th, one Cheryl Hancock is here, a missionary coming all the way from Israel, to bring the news, of, the real news about Israel to us. Please be here before 6 o'clock.
know God's speaking to some of your hearts right now. He's going to speak to your heart, not to your head. You need to let him. You need to give him permission to speak to your heart. Or you really are going to miss why you're on this planet. There are no more tomorrows for Christians to make their decision. There are no more tomorrows. Enough is enough, God has said. And I've not heard that just from me. I've heard too many of my brothers and sisters in Christ get the same word of the Lord. God's, God's timing now is for us to make a decision. One good lunch with us. So when David blows the show far, you're going to have a decision to make, all of you. Are you going to say, Father, not my will, your will be done, and you're going to mean it. Because when he blows the shofar, you're going to seal your deal with God. Like I said, there's no more tomorrows to make your decisions. Don't think you can wait another three months when you got your life all together. You're never going to have it all together. God does. Um, the urgency that was put in my heart and spirit this week is so strong. I've never felt it like that before. God's yearning to seek and to save those that are lost. But He needs the church to do it. Remember something, you're the life of Christ here on this planet. You are. You're the body of Christ. So you're going to bow your heads and you're going to tell God, yay or nay. And it's okay. Don't sit there and go, oh my God, I didn't, I didn't give, him, give him permission for His will today. It's okay. That's your choice. He loves you just the same. He's going to bless you. He's going to love you. He's going to be there with you. But your purposes will not come to fruition in the fullness which only God can do unless you say, not my will, your will be done. It is your decision. God loves you just the same. That's never going to change. It hasn't since He made humanity. His love for us has never changed. But it's your choice today whether you're really going to give God permission for His will in your life or you're going to do it your way. And it's not, oh my God, God's going to come down and beat me on the head now. No, He's not. He's still going to hug you and love you. Because that's His nature. He's a Father like no other. So don't put that wrong kind of fear on you. But if you really want the fullness of God in your life, you will lay it all down this day. And if you give God permission, not my will, your will be done, before you hit that door, you're going to feel changes. Oh, you will. You will. Like I said, I prayed some more of this last night because I had to do it first. And like I said, I've had a screaming headache since about 4 o'clock this morning. It's throbbing like I can't even believe it. But guess what? I know he's taking something out that didn't come from him. He's taking a plant in there that he didn't plant so that I can really have the mind of Christ and the fullness of his thoughts and my thoughts will really become one. Because I gave him permission last night to do what he's asking you to do now. I woke up with peace. Did it hurt? Yeah, that's okay. But whatever he, whatever surge, that shows you how far back that root goes. <laughs> that thing's ingrained in there. Probably in the subconscious somewhere, something I don't even know about. But you know what? He's faithful and true. He loves me. He loves all of you. And he loves all seven billion people. And he wants to save each and every one of them. So it's your decision today whether you want the fullness of God. But if you keep going the way you're going, it's okay. Like I said, don't come back, oh my God, God's going to punish me now. No, He's not. He loved you when you walked in. He'll love you when you walk out. It's not going to be any different. So don't put pressure on yourself. But I can tell you this, the rewards are great. The spiritual rewards that you're going to have inside of you, if you say, Father, not my will, your will be done. But He will change you. He will change you dramatically. He's going to go into those hidden parts that you got inside of you, and they're going to be gone. Hallelujah. Amen. So you bow your heads. I'm going to have David blow the show far. We'll give you a couple seconds to think about what I just said and what God's requiring of you this day.
Almighty God, the God of all love and mercy and peace and forgiveness. Lord Jesus, you came in to seek and to save those that are lost. You freely left eternal glory to come make us your redeemed children, sanctified children, forgiven children, O oh God. Father, you know our hearts. You know us better than we know you. We don't even know what's in us, O oh God. Only you know the depths of our hurts and our pains. Don't say God doesn't understand your pain. Yes, he does. And when you decide to let it heal you, his love to heal you, you will truly be set free. Father, I thank you this day, those hearts that said not their will, but your will be done in their lives. Lord, I just thank you that you give them abounding grace that fear doesn't creep in. And even the ones that aren't really ready to surrender all, Lord, they're still your children. Show them how much they're loved and that you're going to keep pulling on their hearts until they do surrender. We just thank you, Father, that you're smiling upon everybody in here. That your grace and peace abound on everybody in here. I pray a blessing of your holy presence to rest on every heart, soul, and mind in this building right now. And that, God, you bring comfort to the brokenhearted in here. That, Lord, they finally let go of what was behind. They give their past to you so that your blood will wash it away and there will be no remembrance but that your love can come in and heal that pain as you pull it back out in Jesus' name. Because, Lord, you're the friend of a wounded heart. Your love is the only thing that can heal a broken heart, O oh God. And, Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for salvation has come to us all. And that, Lord, from this day forward, we're going to make a renewed commitment to you to go out and share salvation with others. Because, God, you desire that none should perish. Lord Jesus, we can thank you with every breath we have, but that won't ever be enough. Because we're going to have eternity to worship you and serve you. Give us the grace, spiritually endue us with a fresh anointing today, to go out and walk with you and share the finished work of the cross. Father, again, I just thank you, I praise you, I bless you, I love you, I need you. Fall on everybody in here today, God, because you are the one that has come. To restore us to oneness with you. You are the only one that can do it. You are the only one that died and rose again. And overcame sin and death. You Lord Jesus are our life. We bless you. We love you. And we thank you that we are your children. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord.